Welcome to the Cashflow Project Podcast. Are you looking to better your financial situation by increasing your cash flow? Too busy to hunt for real estate deals or don't know where to start? Then you're in the right spot. Join us as we dive in and talk about investing for cash flow using multifamily real estate. Welcome to the Cashflow Project. I'm your host, Duke Ong with Tri-City Equity Group. Today, we have Jake Marmelstein on the show. Jake is the founder of Groundbreaker, the software we are using for our investor portal. It's a secure platform for syndicators to house and distribute investor documents, do ACH disbursements, and communicate with investors. With me is my co-host, Vince Gettings. Hey, Duke. Uh, I'm really excited to have, to have Jake on, on this call. A lot of people don't realize how important this software is uh, or even when they need it. Uh, so Jake really goes into a, a whole lot of detail, gives us a lot of uh, information, a lot of tips, a lot of golden nuggets, uh, not just the software side of the business, but also just being an entrepreneur and growing a business from the ground up. So definitely stay tuned and enjoy the, enjoy the show. Jake, welcome to the show. Thank you, Duke. Pleased to be here. All right. So um, tell me more about the origin story of Groundbreaker and how that fits into the commercial real estate tech world. So, yeah, the story is that I was doing the grunt work of having to manage all of these uh, Excel spreadsheets for my investment firm. And I was banging my head up against the wall. I really worked a lot after, you know, after hours trying to handle all the different things I had between file storage, um, emailing back investor information, uh, one-off requests, handling the data and keeping all the data accurate, um, and then doing, you know, back the envelope calculations for uh, deals and see if they would pencil out to then putting them into presentation materials that we could then use to present to an investment committee of investors. All of that was very manual. And I remember printing out PowerPoint presentations for my boss to go through them with a red pen and mark whatever, you know, formatting errors or numbers that needed to be changed. And it was a very repetitive, monotonous process of being able to maintain uh, the work that, that we had at the company. And we were a staff of five people, uh, lots of opportunities on the table, but we couldn't get to all of them because of the way that we were doing things. And I wanted to be more efficient. And I looked in the market to try to find something and really couldn't. So that was where Groundbreaker became a seed in my mind. And then I ended up uh, finding other people who uh, were interested in this idea, one with an investment banking background, another with a software development background, another with a securities background. And then we had the trifecta. So we went off to create Groundbreaker. And uh, that was maybe a year and a half after the Jobs Act passed in 2012 we were able to get a lot of attention because we had a platform that people could use to put their deal up on the internet and have investors view that deal. What we didn't know was that uh, all of these other uh, players were going to come into the space and offer real estate crowdfunding solutions and that real estate crowdfunding was going to be a huge buzzword and uh, then take a nosedive in the other direction. But at some point we decided that we wanted to offer a software that helped people to be able to have their own environment that they controlled and they could use it to be able to operate their business more efficiently. Yeah, so it sounds like just like scratching your own itch, right? Yeah, essentially it was that. And then after we launched, listening to the market and listening to people talk about you know, the different things that they saw in the product and what made it valuable and what was really uh, talked about the most was having privacy over your own investor list and being able to manage your own data. Whereas at the time, real estate crowdfunding was offering access to capital, but you had to give up all of your control over your branding and what deals they might fund and really um, even your investor base. There was no real ownership of those investors or which investors invest in the deal. So people were concerned about that a lot. And um, we saw that there was a, a unique value proposition in our solution because of those um, uh, the things that we could bring with efficiency and, and being able to have control over those investors. Got it. So how did you set up the company? Um, well, I mean, just with a Delaware uh, C Corp and just, you know, uh, I don't know what it, what exactly is the, is the underlying question. Um, like, you know, like how, how did you start it? Like what kind of structures, um, mm -hmm. like who, who's on your team initially and then how did you hire 
scale? Essentially, we started with the, the founders, um, which had various backgrounds and complementary skills from investment banking and structuring transactions to securities law uh, and being able to understand how to build a PPM and then engineering and being able to build the platform itself. Um, and then I was kind of like more junior on the real estate side, but understood the whole picture and could do sales and kind of be that jack of all trades that the team needed. And uh, we had a challenge being able to, uh, to get to that next point of growth where we validated our concept. We kind of validated the, the concept, but um, didn't uh, end up raising any money. There was some founder disputes and issues over what direction the company wanted to go in. And ultimately what happened was I ended up taking the company in the direction with the software and the other founders kind of dropped off. And I had to end up doing a recapitalization, taking control of the, uh, of the entity, cleaning the cap table, and then restarting the team over time and having more people join. So it's been a really long journey. Um, but what I found is that, um, yeah, it's been a great learning experience. So um, we ended up filling holes where we needed as we went along. Um, we worked as a remote company starting out, which made it easier to find talent. We were able to get revenue and build a product and build a brand and do all these things on no outside investment while I was still working with the uh, issues with capitalization of the company. No investor would really touch us. Uh, and so I had to get to that point until I could do the recapitalization for me to be able to even raise any kind of outside money um, to be able to grow the company further. Yeah, tell me more about that uh, recapitalization or that, that series seed round. Well, uh, we had along the way, we, uh, we were in uh, dialogue with um, one of the former founders of Real Capital Markets. And he was very interested in Groundbreaker. Uh, he found us, he was looking to start his own real estate fund and wanted to use our software. And just through those conversations, I was able to build a relationship. And then he uh, knew that we were looking for outside capital. Um, when I completed the recapitalization, that was when I went hard in that direction of developing the relationship more and digging deeper to see what we could do to fund the company because I thought that he could add a tremendous amount of value to the business seeing as uh, that company is very tangential. Basically, Real Capital Markets sells a software solution to real estate brokers who are in investment sales roles and they sell to property buyers. So the same property buyers that are buying those assets over that exchange are the end users of Groundbreaker, maybe a little bit more upper, mar upper, upper middle market, uh, but he understands ultimately that market and who those people are. So we developed a relationship and then over the course of a year, uh, we ended up lining up uh, capital here in Chicago from the same investors that funded his company back in 1999. And those investors are uh, with us today. They're you know, here in Chicago um, and our uh, real estate family office uh, that has a variety of different businesses, but mainly their, their holdings are in real estate, real estate, private equity. So how have you scaled the company? Well, that's something that I'm, uh, I'm still learning as we go, um, but uh, ultimately finding, you know, finding people that offer complementary skills uh, along what we need to do, product design, engineering, marketing, customer success, and, uh, and sales, and building that core team, and then being able to build out those functional departments as you go and get... Uh, small wins as you go along and continue to figure out where you are and what you need, where the holes are, and then fill those holes as you scale. Um, looking ahead, and that's more of like a measured growth model, which is kind of where we're at right now. Um, when we look to really grow and scale and multiply our, our growth um, exponentially, it's looking at what we've done, seeing how we're performing on certain key metrics, and being able to understand where those metrics lie and what 
uh, investment dollars we can put into the company to be able to make those uh, metrics improve uh, or, or for us to be able to handle more volume at those current metrics so that we can grow the bottom line of the company. Uh, so essentially, you know, I got this core team around. I have a fantastic uh, team now who's operating, you know, firing in all cylinders. And um, we're, we're in the position where uh, we can scale. Uh, we just want to kind of perfect our approach right now of what we're doing, make it better and better and better. And then when we do have outside money to really uh, pour gas on the fire, uh, we're using that money in the most efficient way. So how did you hire your team members? Some of them came to me and found me. Uh, we were in a uh, accelerator program in Puerto Rico and well, that was, that's a whole other story in itself, but we were working there and growing pretty quickly in terms of adding new customers, uh, that year that was back in 2017. And there was a guy that was here that was at the accelerator, uh, doing work, but wasn't in any of the projects. He was just a Puerto Rican local that was, uh, working and, and wanted to be in a co-working space, I guess. Uh, and he worked at uh, Buzzfeed and had also previous career working as an early employee at Warby Parker. Um, and we ended up, you know, becoming friends and then the opportunity arose that we needed somebody in that role to be our product manager. And it was a huge role of which I didn't really understand how much work was required in the role at the time. Uh, cause I was handling some of it and, um, and we ended up, you know, coming together and bring him on board the team. And it was a huge win for us as, as a company to get somebody with that kind of experience on board. And it just kind of happened. Um, after that, it's understanding what exactly you need at the time and uh, being able to describe that role extremely well, know what it's not. Um, so for our customer success role, um, we ended up actually putting out an ad and we got a bunch of applications and we were very lucky to find the person that we found who's now in the role. Um, so there's various ways that you can do it, but I think for anybody that's listening and trying to get some value out of this, it's really understanding what the role is and what it's not, um, because you can make very many mistakes on hiring uh, the wrong people for the wrong stage of the company's growth. And at this stage where we're at, we need people who are doers, builders, who are really responsible and are willing to dig in and also work on the front lines and in the trenches. And that's kind of a rare combo of finding someone that has those abilities. Um, so, uh, it, it took a lot of reflection and many other mistakes to get us to here. So what are the most common and trending real estate deal structures, uh, that you've seen? Uh, it's kind of like in flux these days, honestly, like I've heard of people doing, uh, three, like a pref and then two tiers of a waterfall structure as the typical, like an eight pref, and then some kind of a split up to a 12. And then there's like a home run split at the end. Uh, that would be typical, but I've heard more and more of people that just do a higher pref and then one tier of a split. I don't know if that's in your experience at all, like where, where things are going, but because of the market changing a little bit, I think maybe investors want less risk and not more. And so having a higher pref uh, for that first pref and then maybe only one split gives less risk for the investor and still gets the upside for the sponsor. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, especially in these times, uh, I, I would imagine investors are looking for more safety. So yeah, higher prep would be more attractive. So how can uh, investor relations for syndication be approved? Well, that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, but overall, what it boils down to is consistency and doing what you say you're going to do. So if you say you're going to hit an 8% uh, IRR or 12 or whatever the IRR is, uh, or the cash on cash return that you say you're going to get, even if you miss it, it would be good to tell the investors what you got, when you got it, why it's different, and be able to 
to defend if you need to compare the two. Or if you're even operating on a more transparent mindset, you can show them where you expected it to be and where you actually got to, whether you're below or above. They appreciate that because it's about uh, keeping trust as you go along, um, especially if these investors haven't invested with you before. So if they, if, if they have, uh, imagine it's your first time investing with someone, you know, you give, you give your money away and you want to hear like consistent, you don't need to get updates every week, but at least if there's like an update, you know, that you can look forward to and you know that it's going to be there when it's supposed to be there, uh, that builds trust. And I think going back to Groundbreaker and what we do, our solution just makes it possible for that to happen on a more consistent basis with much more certainty because we offer a system that no matter how many investors you have, you still have the ability to send out uh, that email report um, or provide that financial information to the investor at scale. It doesn't matter how many people you get, uh, you can still carry it out and it's not going to cost you extra work or time to do that for the more people that you have on board. Um, and so I think just to wrap up that point, being consistent uh, with, with, with your messaging um, is, a, is a good way to improve investor relations. And not a lot of people do that. So in your journey as an entrepreneur, what's the biggest mistake you've made and what have you learned from that? So it's, it's part of learning. Like you don't know what you're getting into when you start and embark on this journey. There's no way to know what you're going to have to face and what you're going to have to know and learn to be able to succeed. So I'd say it's really getting outside help. Having a mentor and an advisor is the biggest thing that, uh, that I've done to impact, you know, my journey and help to see my blind spots so that I don't make as many mistakes. You still make them, but having somebody who's been there and done that is immensely valuable. And no matter like what you think it's going to cost you upfront, it'll save you money and be a good return on investment in the long run. I firmly believe that. So for folks that are thinking about getting like coaching or, uh, or advisory, it, it's definitely uh, worth it if, if the coaching is effective and other people have tried and it's, 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 you know, you have to obviously vet the person and everything, but having that outside advisor is very helpful. So my mistake was not getting one earlier. A lot, a lot of times what I've seen that for, for coaching is people be, get stuff like that because they, they're told they're supposed to, but they're personally not ready to get a coach or, or a mentor. Like they're not ready for the mentor. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is they, they don't do anything. Like they don't do any of this stuff they say, um, or they do it and then just, fail because they weren't ready for it and then they go on and start dogging you know this brand of coaching or, or whatever or this person and it really wasn't the coach or the mentors you know fault it was just they just weren't ready and they weren't willing to put in the work or they just weren't at a point in their career or their you know maturity level to to uh be accepting of of that kind of stuff so that's what i've seen in most cases when it comes to coaching it's like it's all really good but you know the student has to be ready for it yeah, Vince, it's true. It's just, that's part of the reason why I didn't have one. Maybe, you know, wasn't aware what I needed to do. So mm -hmm. very, very true. You have to be open to getting the feedback and welcoming it and, and making an impact with it. So before the call, we were talking about the importance of investors, knowing how to vet and compare software. Uh, I know you said that was like a whole podcast on its own, but would you be able to um, like take a couple minutes just to recap, like whatever the key points of thoughts when, when there's people like out shopping around? Sure. So my experience being in the space for almost like six years now tells me that real estate people on average don't, uh, they don't have a lot of experience evaluating software and technology. Um, sometimes they think that just because uh, somebody's in business that they have a, a good you know, application um, that it does all the things that they in their mind think it does um, or, or that the company has uh, the best intentions and is a good company. Um, 
And for the most part, that could be true, but uh, it's important to use the information available to be able to make better interpretations on the company and the product uh, to then know what you're dealing with. Um, and I'd say looking at how much, how much a company provides about themselves is very telling. Like, do they have a page on, do, well, do they have a good website? Because the way that your website is designed and looks is probably a reflection of the way that your software is designed and looks and performs um, because it takes programming to build a website. So you get to look at the quality of the work of the engineering team that did that by just looking at their site and, um, and, and their, you know, the level of, uh, of design that, you know, they're, they're happy with. Uh, so that's a good reflection right off the bat. And then just, do they have a team page? What does their team look like? Mm -hmm. Who are their investors? They have investors. How is their company, you know, able to run and, and, and operate? And uh, how many people do they have working on the product? Do they have a good engineering team? Is it sufficient enough? And, you know, if you have like one engineer in the team and every, and there's a bunch of people doing sales, then you can kind of tell that like the company's more focused on revenue and less on product. Um, in a time like now with this real estate investment space, it's a relatively new, you know, product. It hasn't been around before. So everybody's new. So that would be a red flag if you don't see a lot of engineers on a team working on a product because um, uh, they need to be able to build it. It's not like it's something off the shelf that they could just repurpose. Um, and it's not easy to build despite what everyone thinks when they say that could be easy. It's not, it takes much longer than you think. So uh, just being able to evaluate a company by looking at them and their background and, and you know, who they are and what resources they have is a very good indicator. Uh, I think next it's just important to be able to understand what it is that you want, um, what it is that you need. Don't be fooled by fancy bells and whistles and a high price point for a software and a team that makes you think that you need this because you're going to be more official and more professional with your investors. If you're just starting out and you need something that's simple but does the job, then just look at what is the output that you're going to get from the application from the vendor that you're working with. And then any kind of enhancements and changes later, that goes back to the earlier part of your due diligence how well is this company positioned to be able to grow? Great. Um, so uh, big fan of like Michael Gerber's uh, E-Myth. And I don't know if you've read that or not, but I know uh, in that, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs are really good uh, tacticians, but lack like leadership skills on like how to grow and steer a business. Right. And we were talking about scaling up. So what challenge challenges have you had and what advice do you have for our listeners that are looking to, do their own startup. You know, they're really good at, you know, making widgets, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean they're going to be good at, you know, owning a widget company. Right. Well, yeah, you, you hit it on the head, the nail on the head. You have to be able to be able to lead and to be able to lead, you have to be able to hire the right people. If you don't hire the right people, then you can't give them the responsibility that they need to be able to grow the company and that you need to let go of so that you can grow the company. So you need to be able to relinquish control and responsibility over things, but still be involved enough so that you can maintain quality and consistency of the deliverables that are getting churned out until there's a point where full ownership and control is no longer risk because the people you have and the systems you have are operating and, uh, and, and working the way that you need them to. So it's really about hiring and um, not just being good at hiring, but knowing what you like knowing what you need, who you need, when you need them, at what stage, and then being able to get those people motivated and give them the right, you know, upside and compensation and vision so that they know that what they're doing is more impactful and meaningful than whatever else they could do. So when, yeah, you have to give a, uh, you have to give your people a why so they have buy-in, right? Exactly. So they buy in, they take ownership of the process and it's not just a job. Um, that they have, they have ownership and they, they know that they can affect the outcome of, of this product. All right. So what are your best ninja chip ninja tips for real estate investors? Uh, well, okay. 
um, maybe I can focus that down to like. And it could be something you've already said in the last 30 minutes. Yeah. I mean, I'd say you got to have like, do, do your, uh, like, like do could probably chime in here, but do your first deal on your own. And if you, if you can, um, so that you can learn and learn on your own money, uh, because you'll go into the next deal that much better. Uh, I don't know, Duke, if I would re recommend that uh, to knowing where you are now, but I personally would feel better knowing how many mistakes, you know, one will make when they're learning. So do it on your own and learn the mistakes yourself on your own money. Um, Cause it'll deal, it'll, it'll mean a lot fewer um, issues later on with investors. If you, if you screw up, um, and then like, don't, um, I don't know, don't spend too much money out of pocket on things you don't need. Get a Squarespace site, get a Wix site, get a Weebly site. Like don't buy a, a fancy website and get a designer and who cares about your logo? Like just get a deal done, mm -hmm. you know, MVP, everything. Yeah, I think for the, um, and I, I advocate for the, the same, especially going into syndication. It, you know, this is, it's not something that's easy at all and e even for me i've have um you know 10 or so or more multifamily deals uh before we did a syndication and i still like got taken to school on on some things like like ground like your software like you don't need that buying you know a, a eight unit right <laughs> like a power yeah. building right so uh just learning that whole side of the the world is is um very uh very challenging um, especially when you think you, you know, you have a good grasp of what's going on. Um, so uh, yeah, I definitely advocate for like, I could, you know, sandbox properties, what I call them. Like, so just go buy something small, like, you know, even if it's a, whatever you can afford at that time, a four unit or something like that, you know, learn, learn the process of, of owning, managing, buying, uh, exiting real estate. Um, and, and the big one for me is like a SWOT analysis, right? Like understand where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are. Um, that way, when you're looking to scale up, you know who you need to bring on for partners because you know where your weaknesses are. So it would make sense to uh, go find a partner that complements your weaknesses with their strengths. Right. So I, I definitely advocate for, for that. Um, and then, you know, scaling up to, to syndication later on, once you have a good grasp of the business and, and especially what your weaknesses and strengths are. So absolutely. Well, that is it for me. All right. So what is the best book that you recommend? Uh, all right. Fiction or nonfiction? Uh, nonfiction. Nonfiction. Okay. Well, now I'm interested. I, we got to hear the other one anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the best books was this uh, book called Millionaire Next Door. Because, yep. yeah, if you're thinking about wealth and your objective is to be financially independent and create wealth for yourself and, and maybe even future generations. That book sort of opens your mind up to what's possible and, uh, and how you can achieve it. And it just, yeah. it's one of those things that expands your mind, you know, but by, it's very by Thomas Stanley. If uh, anybody's looking to, I pulled my copy up, but then there's also, uh, there's also other ones that I like. Uh, I've got, uh, Sam Carpenter, Work the System. I really like that book okay. for people who want to build process, be process oriented uh, in their business. It's just a good framework to think about. It's all about building working procedures and establishing the, you know, the structure and documentation of a business to operate. And then uh, what's your superpower? I think I'm pretty good at listening to people's problems and understanding you know, what they need. Um, and developing, you know, the relationship around being on the same team and, you know, working with a solutions mindset. And that is usually what helps me when it comes to every, everything, you know, sales, hiring, dealing with problems that come up. What are your hobbies? Uh, I love snowboarding and surfing and rock climbing. Uh, Duke's a rock climber. Yeah, and I surf too, so... <laughs> But well, I have to definitely have to connect on that. Yeah, man. Hawaii's waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so yeah, what, what is your favorite travel destination? I probably haven't discovered it yet, but I've been to uh, Rio de Janeiro and lived there. And I have to say, it's one of the most amazing places I've been in the world and beautiful because it's got mountains, it's got beach, it's got city, there's culture and music there. Uh, so that's why that one. Also, San Sebastian in, in Spain is phenomenal. It's, it's, got, it's got the same kind of attributes. So that kind of combination of mountain, city, and beach is nice. All right. So as we wrap up, um, do you have any requests for our audience? And uh, how can people reach out to you? Yeah, if you're, if you're looking at uh, getting involved in real estate syndication or you are syndicating and you're looking for a better way to do it, then you can always go to groundbreaker.co, look at our software, get in contact with the team. Uh, even if you're not in the market to buy anything, we're happy to talk with you and shed some light on what you're dealing with. So you can contact me, Jake Marmelstein at groundbreaker.co and just fill out the form on our site and we'll be in touch. All right, awesome. Thanks so much uh, for your time and uh, I'll see you next time. Yeah, thank you. Hey Duke, that was an awesome show here. Um, definitely some awesome ninja tricks and golden nuggets from Jake. I, I love uh, his points on uh, hiring the right people at the right time. So as, as a leader, as an entrepreneur, uh, you're gonna be the tactician at first, you know, the expert at whatever that thing you're doing. And at some point you need to start scaling your business and, and being able to be cognizant and aware of uh, making sure you're hi hiring high quality people to take on, to delegate tasks to, that they can take uh, those tasks and run with them. Um, that way you can step back a little bit and grow the business. Uh, so it's a, it's a key point for, for entrepreneurs uh, to, to know when to put that leadership hat on. Uh, another, another thing he brought up was make sure that when, when you're, growing a business and you're trying to do a new startup to make sure you're spending your time and energy on the right things at the right time. So we see it all the time in real estate, especially, uh, you know, new people come in and they, they fill their, their calendars and their schedules like busy work. Like I'm going to go spend, you know, three days building a website or, uh, you know, a whole week designing my business cards and going out and getting, you know, magnets for my car and let everybody know that I'm a real estate investor now, but they've never done a deal and they don't have deal flow. They're not talking to brokers. They're not, they're not out there, um, you know, getting soft commitments from potential investors. Like they're not doing the work that matters. They're just filling their time with just busy work that, you know, the, they go, you know, they go weeks and like, wow, I got so much work done. Look at all these, you know, check boxes I have on my, my calendar. I'm, just, I'm, I'm crushing it, but really they're just, uh, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, like delaying. Like they, they don't want to spend the time on the things that matters. They're just filling their, their schedule with like busy work. So, um, you know, just being cognizant of that. I was like, is, is this task uh, growing the revenue of my company or is it not? Because if it's not and you're a startup, you need to not be doing that. You need to be focusing on building, uh, increasing the revenue of your company, getting lead generation in and closing deals. Um, the... Uh, also the transparency. So that's a big one for us. You know, we, we, uh, we value transparency and, and trust a whole lot. So having, you know, his, tri uh, his tip on, you know, being transparent with, uh, for him to be transparent with us as, as a vendor to the, to the investor, to the client, but also turning around and, and, and putting that on us as, as the syndicators, as the managing partners, like, Hey, we should be transparent with, uh, the investors, just as much, right? So here's our projections for this quarter and, and or here, here's what our assumptions were and here's what our actuals were uh, for this quarter. And, and that really builds that trust and understanding. So even if we go over budget on something, uh, don't try to hide it. Don't try to, you know, uh, wash it out with other tasks or other things. Um, so like, this is why, why we went over budget on this task. And this is, uh, what we're going to do to make sure we don't do it next time. And investors uh, are usually a lot more understanding if you show them the whole process. So like, this is what happened. This is what we were thinking. And this is uh, in reality, how it, how it played out. So transparency um, definitely breeds uh, trust and understanding. And that goes in anything in business. Yep. Couldn't agree more. 
Um, check out the show notes for a discount on Groundbreaker if you're a syndicator looking to take your investor relations to the next level. If you're interested in connecting with us, go to tricityequity.com to learn more. To connect with like-minded investors, join our Facebook group, Honolulu Multifamily and More. And if you found value in this podcast, please share and give us a rating and review on iTunes. See you next time.